Welcome to this presentation brought to you by the Shenango Valley Amateur Radio Association. This video was recorded during our meeting on February 4th, 2021. Our presenter is Brian Webster, Amateur Radio Call Sign N2KGC, that's November 2 Kilo Golf Charlie. He has been an amateur radio operator for over 30 years. He is the coordinator for the Catskill region of the Western New York District of the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, known as ARIES, and is the radio officer for the Otsego County Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, known as RACES. Brian also works in the radio and wireless technology fields professionally with his wireless mapping and communication system engineering company. Without further ado, here is Brian's presentation about packet radio. Well, good evening, everyone. Most everybody here, with the exception of Don, I think, knows me uh, from one club or the other. Or uh, I, we were discussing this on the radio. I've been a ham for 30 years already, and I don't even think it's possible, but apparently it has. Um, the presentation tonight is on packet radio. And uh, when I started in ham radio in 1990, packet radio was huge. Dial-up internet and dial-up bulletin board systems like CompuServe and AOL were just starting. And uh, they were typically long distance phone calls and phone lines at the time didn't have unlimited long distance. So you were dialing Binghamton, Albany, or uh, uh, New York City running up a horrendous phone bill, plus tying up your single phone line in your house to get into the information age and start things like looking up phone numbers nationwide. And, you know, the basic things we did at the, at the beginning of uh, online uh, and now look at the internet. But still the packet radio networks are still alive, still uh, still working, and uh, so my presentation is going to be on that with the uh, focus more so on what does a user do for packet. And let's see, so I got to share this screen, right? Bring this up. Oh, I've only got one screen on this laptop. I'm so used to two of them. All right, uh, look at that. Packet radio. So packet radio is not APRS. APRS technically is packet radio, but it's this is a totally different animal and a totally different system. So packet radio is a connected data stream or data system over radio. Above the HF frequencies, the speeds are typically from 1200 to 9600 baud, with 1200 baud being the most common. It uses terminal node controllers or TNCs. That's the equivalent of what you would call the modem back in the day when we did dial up. And once you're on packet, there's many applications, software, things to do that you're going to find on the packet system. So you've got the concept of a network versus ad hoc packet. What I'm talking about is routed, connected, backbone packet networks, not just sending data back and forth between two stations or two or three stations that can hear each other. These networks are usually not on just one single frequency. Your node sites, which is a collection of the backbone links and your, what we call the user port, are typically on high hilltops, tower sites. And those nodes sit high enough that they can see another node long distance away. And you link them together and you're building a network. There's always some sort of routing involved. And uh, again, the links between the sites are called backbones. So what can you do on packet radio? Well, uh, the, the, just a short list we've got. You can do email, and we're talking internet connected email, whether it's through the WinLink system, or uh, in, in our local cases, we've got AX mail servers, which is just like a POP uh, or SMTP internet connected email server, and these are internet connected, as well as on, on our AX mail servers, we can send faxes. Uh, one of the other applications is that you can log into a DX cluster and get DX spots, which back in the day when we just had dial up internet and you didn't leave your internet connected all the time to your computer, DX cluster spots were great over the packet network because you didn't have to be on the internet to, to get your spots. We've got chat rooms as well as uh, national and regional chat servers. We've got bulletin board systems that still work. And to some of you, that may be a, an old uh, term that you're like, well, oh, I haven't thought about that in a long time. And quite a few, uh, this may be a new concept. 
There's also the ability to do what we call keyboard to keyboard chats where you can connect to another person live real time and type to each other and, and just send messages back and forth. We've also got the ability to connect to uh, SQL based databases to do things like uh, shelter management, uh, public service events, whether it's the canoe regatta and checking community, uh, uh, the canoes and things like that. Uh, it's just a generic database that sits on a node and runs and you can actually start a new file and define the database right there on the fly. So uh, that's just one of the things for emergency management. That's an interesting application on packet. How do you use the network? Well, a user station just consists of a, of a computer of some sort, a radio, an antenna, and some sort of modem or TNC. Uh, the TNCs can be sound card based or a hardware based TNC. And again, there's, there's many of these units. It's similar to, but not the same as APRS. This is what we call connected packet, where you connect, you send a packet, just like on TCP IP on the internet, where the other station says, yeah, I got that packet. Here's my acknowledgement, send me the next one. APRS is just a broadcast spray and pray type technology using the same format, but it's just a different animal and how it's structured and built. This is connected packet. This is just like being on the internet, albeit slow and less gooey, less graphical stuff. But uh, so the, it's a big distinction and difference between APRS. So sometimes the hardware that you would use for APRS might work for packet and some situations it might not work for connected packet very well. So the user station radio interface, you've got a radio and you've got your TNC and your modem and you've got four basic connections, receive audio, transmit audio, ground, and the push to talk. Push to talk and, and connected packet is critical because you really can't use Vox. Vox is too slow to get everything switched around from the transmit to receive cycle to get those data bursts going back and forth with the packet and then the acknowledgement and the resends and, and such. So uh, Vox is not good for connected packet. Uh, and uh, we actually tested that a little bit last night, right, John? Yep. Uh, he's finding out he's getting disconnected and I'm thinking that's probably because he's got some sort of Vox set up through his signal link interface. The radio requirements, really quite simple. A two meter radio will get you in on what we call the user ports, which is the frequency that you can connect into the network or the point of egress and ingress into the network. Uh, you don't have to get in on the backbone, you just get on a user port and then the routing system takes care of it from there. This radio doesn't need PL tone capability, which means a lot of old radios are kicking around out there that don't do PL that work great for packing. Is PL? have to be off for packet or can it be used? It should be off because that subaudible tone could start uh, to mess with the uh, packet. Tone. Packet is uh, what they call AFSK, audio frequency shift key. Uh, key. <laughs> and uh, what it is, it's it's just like the old telephone modems. It's a shift between two tones, 1200 and 2200 Hertz. And the modem detects the shift to give you your ones and zeros in your binary communication. So it's an audio frequency that's transmitted over your FM carrier and uh, the, the PL tone could or could not interfere. It, we always turn it off though. Low power will work well for most people because the, the user ports are typically located such that they've got good coverage for something like a five watt HT hooked up to the TNC or modem. And again, a lot of people have got old HTs that don't do the old that PL tones that they can't get into the repeaters with. So they make great little packet radios. Uh, you have to have an interface cable between your TNC or your sound card and your radio. And again, it has those four connections, transmit audio, receive audio, ground, and push to talk. It, you really wanna have an outdoor antenna because especially on HTs, when you're transmitting on the rubber duck with data, very many times that RF will close to the wires will key up the transmit and put the radio into a locked up transmit condition. So, uh, and that's typically one of the more daunting tasks. If you can't buy a, a pre-made cable for your radio and TNC combination, you have to make one and that intimidates a lot of people. Computer requirements. They're all over the board, but they're really quite simple. Any computer that can act as a terminal 
like you would have in a, an old dial-up modem days or anything, will work as a packet computer, as long as you have the hardware TNC. Yet there's a lot of programs out there that will function as packet programs that are more glorified than just the, the terminal program. Uh, there's also a lot of specialized programs that do the sound card TNCs. And the sound card TNCs start, you know, the more common ones, Direwolf is one of them. UZ7HO is another one that's out there that's sound card based that has the software and uh, drives the sound card to turn it into a, to a packet modem. The AGW packet engine is another one. Uh, Windows, you can get, you know, all kinds of packet programs under for Windows. There's a lot of packet programs for Linux and because of Linux, Raspberry Pis. So you can actually take a Raspberry Pi, turn it into a packet terminal and make your cables on a to your radio and Raspberry Pis make nice little packet system. And then of course, uh, the Macintosh iOS systems. Uh, there are many terminal programs that will work on Android and iPhone as well. Uh, interfacing between the phone and the and the, the TNC is just a little bit more of a challenge, but not impossible. You know, there's options out there, including Bluetooth and not even having to have a wire between the, the computer and the TNC. So more specifically, Shenango County now has its own dedicated packet node that's on what we call the New York net, which is also linked to the East net system. This map that you're looking at right now is the network packet system that we have running in New York state and New England today. Uh, Jeff, Main, uh, Main KP3FT, uh, we have uh, helped him build a packet node and link it into our packet system. So his packet node actually has a computer, two radio TNCs and two radios. One of them links into the backbone. He Right now he's linking into our Cherry Valley site, NC2C into the backbone there. And then he has a user port designed for the users and this one specifically was set up more to cover Shenango County, even though he's in Otsego County, because we've got a lot of coverage in Otsego County. The purpose always was to make it a packet node for the Shenango County and the Norwich Club. Uh, the, there are some internet links that are bridging these islands that we have right now, because where we used to have RF linking across the whole state, some of those nodes disappeared, people died or they died, and we're working on rebuilding them so that we don't have to rely on these internet links to bridge the islands. And the islands out in Rochester, Otsego County to Albany, then we've got the downstate. Uh, you know, so yeah, and you, those green dotted lines are uh, representative of internet links that are bridging the packet networks right now. A lot of packet systems, people think they're building a packet network because they're doing one of two programs, one of them being WinLink where they put up a radio and a TNC and offer local coverage, but then that WinLink software is just linked directly to the internet. If you've got a regional internet outage, it's useless. Uh, a lot of people are building BPQ nodes on Raspberry Pis and such, and they're building them the same exact way. Single radio and TNC for local use, but then it immediately connects to the internet. Our network is different in the fact that, and it always was back in the days when it was the 90s, we had the network going from Maine to Ohio all with volunteers, backbone links, user port nodes, and we're working on building again. The state of New York through the Office of Homeland Security and the state races is pushing to get the packet network reestablished. They want to rely on that as a backup system that is independent of the internet. So um, the, we use, uh, there's a, a couple of different operating systems that different pa packet networks around the country use. Uh, BPQ uses what they call NetROM, uh, and so does JNOS. Uh, those are two uh, popular node operating software packages. The Cantronics T K TNCs, a lot of people built networks around what they call their KA node software that can run directly in the TNCs. Our network, we're running FlexNet, and FlexNet's a different operating system. It uses the AX25 protocol but FlexNet has got some secret sauce in it whereby it's much faster and much more data payload efficient than the NetROM and KA node stuff. Especially now that we've got all these dedicated backbones, we can push a lot of data and I can show you some tests when I do the demo. But, you know, 
I just that's just to to show you that it's a network system uh, that eventually will have replaced or have links that don't rely on the internet. What was I'm sorry? What was that? Uh, most the southeast, most southeast station in our area there. Uh, hey, you know what? I've got a better way to show this because I pulled the node maps up here. Uh, so let's see. We want to get to the central New York. That's the Connecticut downstate. You're talking about this stuff here? Yeah. Southeast. Stanford? Stanford, yeah. It's up on Mount Utsianta. Yeah. Um, yeah, just recently got linked back in. No, it's always been linked. We just finally got a user port back. That's what it for. Was. Um, so let's talk about these nodes. Yeah, that's uh, so as a user, uh, Jeff's node has got a user port on two meters on 147.54. Uh, in Oneana, we've got a user port on 147.51. In Cherry Valley, we've got the user port on 147.48. And people are like, well, I thought packet was all done on 145. You said 145, one was on the right? Oneana is 51. Cherry Valley is 147.48. Yep. Jeff's, uh, you know, is 147.54. Stanford is on 145.77. A lot of the common frequencies that most people think about is 145.01, 145.07, 09. And we've opted to go to the 147 simplex channels because back in the day, everybody and their brother was on those lower ones. And specifically in Cherry Valley, we went to that because we've got the repeater on 145.35. So it was it, putting the packet up on 147 helped us mitigate interference. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, that's the thing. You just get in on the user port and then you can connect to the node in the system. And there's all kinds of cool things you can do, but there's, there's some commands and things you got to learn how to do. Uh, so I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to jump from this I'm going to bring up a terminal program. And for those of you who are here, uh, I've got my power supply. I've got my two meter radio. I've got this particular two meter radio has one of those eight pin mini din jacks. And that comes out and it goes over to my, I have a hardware based TNC, the modem. And, uh, and then that TNC has a serial port. And here on my laptop, I have uh, a USB to serial adapter. And I'm just running the program called Putty. Those of you who may or may not be familiar with that. So this TNC, it's its own little computer. You can have a dumb terminal, a VT100 VT terminal, and it'll talk to this because it's its own computer. So if you look on the screen right now, I've got my terminal mode up. I'm hitting the enter key and the TNC is telling me, oh, I'm in command mode, I'm ready to accept commands. And there's a manual, like one of the first things you do, I do the my command, which you want to say what call sign is programmed in this TNC? What is my call for this radio? And right now I've got it set for N2KGC. Now, if I wanted to change this, I could go my, and then I could go N2YP, and I could set that to John's call sign now. So now if I do the my, and as soon as I transmit, I'm transmitting under John's call sign. Right now I'm not transmitting anything, so that's okay. But I'm going to change it back to my call sign. That's the thing that you use the note. No, it won't. So there's the, uh, and there's all kinds of commands. Like there's things like, that I know I don't have and this TNC, I think is a daytime command. The clock's not set. I'd have to, and I'd have to go look up how to set the clock. But that's just tells you, that's just so you can program your TNC. Sound card TNCs and stuff like that don't have this, but hardware ones do. All right, so I've got my call sign. So in packet, you do what they call connects. So. The C command is the connect command. And then you want to connect to another station. Now, right now, I know that Jeff's node, we have set that user port. His call sign is KP3FT. But there's what they call SSIDs, and you've probably seen that in uh, APRS as well. Uh, we use SSIDs in the uh, connected packet as well, and I know his user port is dash two. So I'm going to do that. What's going to happen is as soon as I hit enter, the TNC is going to push the radio into transmit. It's going to transmit the audio tones. Jeff Snow is going to hear it. It's going to send a, oh yeah, I heard you. Here you go ahead. You're connected. It'll send a connect message back and log me into the system. So here we go. That's Jeff Snow transmitting back. That's, that's that raspy sound is the audio tones. So I connected right to Jeff first try. And so it's, I'm connected to this FlexNet node. 
you see on the screen, there's some things that you can do, the basic help commands and everything like that. So in packet, most people call them nodes. That's where all the other backbones connect to each other. In FlexNet, they're called destinations. So if I do a D command, once I'm connected now, it'll tell me the nodes that I can connect to from Jeff's. So right now, oh, we've got a good, this nodes list, the nice thing about FlexNet, you don't have to know how to get to any of these other places. It's a routed system. You try to connect to one of those, it knows how to get you there. Send you which backbones, which internet links if it has to, and uh, it routes the system for you. These, these routing tables on FlexNet are updated every three minutes. No, every six minutes, excuse me. Uh, so if you see it, it should be connectable. So we've got one, two, three, four, we got six. We've got uh, almost 28 different FlexNet nodes, uh, mostly around New York State and they're back on this map, you'll see them, right? And, and then others because they go farther out than the network. So I'll go back here. So let's see, like K2DLL, that's the node that's in Saratoga. So I'm going to do, once I'm connected, I can do a C for connect, space, and I go K2DLL. One thing you want to do is look at this list and C, pay attention to the SSID. So K2DLL is right here, and they're using SSID 0 through 6. So I can just connect to K2DLL. It'll try to connect to, six, or to 0. It always uses the lowest one. But like in my case, like if you look at N2KGC, my node, I start at one and go through 14. So if you try to connect to N2KGC, it'll go nowhere. But if you go to N2KGC-1, then it'll connect to the node. So if I connect to K2DLL, I can tell you right now, this is going to Jeff, it's going to, Sir, uh, going to the Cherry Valley node, then it's going to Saratoga. It's a two hop system, and one of the hops is 9600 baud. So now it's, it's telling me I'm setting up the link, and look how fast it connected. That's not bad for a 1200 baud over the air system. Now it's gonna send me its connect message back, so. It takes a little bit, but remember, we're not connected to the internet here. Nothing's going on the internet. Brian, how can some of them show multiple listings for the same? Because they're probably physically different computers. Oh. And you'll notice that right next to them, you see different SSID ranges. Oh, yeah. That's how you know that's the differences. The yeah, no, that's a very good question. I wasn't sure why. I've been doing this stuff I continuously. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it jumped right out. Yeah, yeah. W2DUC, he's got. Yeah. Uh, 25 years ago, I used, to, I used to sit in my basement and connect to Australia. Yep. Oh, we can do that now. I'll show you how to do that next. All right. We're, we're getting there. Walk it before we run, John. So this is, so, uh, and if I do a destinations list there, I should get the same list because, again, it's all the same network and they're all routable. No, oh, it only gave me a short list because that's only on that port. If I do a space after the D with the asterisk, it says, show me all your destinations. It should give me the same as that list that's up there. No, I don't have to have this volume turned up. I'm turned down. And, and so I, I'm saying that only because if someone wants to set up a packet station. You don't have to listen to yeah, you don't have to listen to the packets. Come on, you can fall asleep to that. I, yeah, I I've been doing it long enough. I can, I, I can almost decode some of them in my ear. <laughs> that that was always the joke back in the day when we were still doing Morse code. Is like, oh, we're going to have an advanced extra license, and instead of doing you know twenty five words a minute code, you got to be able to decode packet at twelve hundred baud by ear. You know, <laughs> so I mean that's just being able to connect to other nodes. One of the interesting things is what they call an MH command or my herd. So we're in Saratoga. Their user port, I know off the top of my head, they've got a packet user port on 145.01. And because I'm connected to them right now, I can say, tell me what you've heard on your node. Yeah. So we're gonna do that. We're doing the MyHerd for Saratoga. You know, you're, it's, it's, all coming, it's coming back to you now, right? It's on this side, it's on the Oh yeah, the old acoustic couplers, yeah. I don't remember any of that, only. So what you're looking at here is that this is at Saratoga's node. This is what they've heard on all their ports from the newest, you know, from the most recent to the oldest, right? So port two is NC2C-1, that's the Cherry Valley node. That's a backbone link, that's 9,600 baud. N2PKB was heard on port four. That's the Stanford node 30 seconds ago. 
port zero on most nodes is supposed to be the user port. So N2MNT-1, that's actually in the Montgomery County EOC. So they've got a packet station there. Uh, port three, KE2PW-1, that's Rusty, and he's got a node at his house that's linked to the internet. Port zero on the user port, you see this KB2NGK-10? SSID protocol is anything that's a dash 10 is a Winlink RMS gateway. So there's actually off Saratoga's node, someone has a Winlink gateway on the packet network. So, I mean, but it told you how long ago it was heard, 29 minutes, 50 seconds, 56 seconds ago. So uh, this KC2FTD-1, that's actually the, the node that's in the New York State Police Headquarters in Albany. So we've got the network built right into the city and the state bunker. But that's just one of those things you can do on there. But now, a lot of packet systems, B or the by command disconnects you. Flexnet uses Q for quit. So I'm going to quit this one. But the neat thing about this is it's going to drop me back to the last node I was connected to, not drop my connection all the way back to my home TNC. So notice I'm reconnected back to Jeff's node. Now, you wanted to go to Australia and all that stuff. So Flexnet has his destinations. On the URO nodes that we run on the packet network, we're also linked to the NetROM systems. So you've got to connect to a different SSID. So on Jeff's node, we want to connect to KP2 or KP3FT-1. That's going to connect, switch over to his NetROM side. And this runs the URO node software. Now I can do an N command, which is similar to the destinations command, but on NetROM it's for nodes. So I'm going to do this. And these are all the nodes that he connects to. And admittedly, this is through his internet connection, not through the radio. Uh -huh. um, but again, you're seeing, so NetROM uses what they call a pair of alias and then a call sign. So you can connect to either one between those uh, semicolons. Okay. Uh, but let's see here. So anything, again, dash 10 is going to be a... So RMS CHB on the bottom left column here is K3C, C, or K3CHB-10. He's down in Pennsylvania, but he's running an RMS gateway. So any of you that like to run Winlink, you're probably gonna have to manually connect, but then you connect to K3CCHB-10 and then initiate your sequence to send a Winlink email and it'll do it. Just like you're connected on HF or whatever. So you've got connectivity to the Winlink system through our network packet. Uh, on the local node or even remote nodes, you know, because if that one's not working or doesn't show up on the list, you connect somewhere else look for a dash 10, do the process again. Uh -huh. Admittedly, I tried to figure out tonight if I could get my Winlink software running and I can't find my Winlink password to save my life. And it didn't, and the password reminder didn't come in before I left. So I was going to try to do that tonight. And you can still actually connect manually and just do it text-based right on the screen and not even have to be running the Winlink software. Uh, some people may not have done that. It might get a little confusing, but it's possible. I've done it before. Um, so we've done that. Uh, I'm going to quit out of this node and go back to the FlexNet node. Is N1LEE still around? I haven't seen that one in a while in any of the nodes list. But, uh, you know. Well, so interestingly enough, when you connect to any node or any remote station, the I command is always a good one to try. It's for the info command, right? No? You know, we don't have it. Canadian stations. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna disconnect from his NetROM side and I'm gonna go back to his FlexNet and then I'll do the info command. So say, notice I'm reconnected, so it just drops me back one hop. I'll issue the I command. And it may to FRY query when you have a moment. Okay. So the system info, you see that come up. It's a FlexNet Digi and, you know, just the, the basic information. So when you're doing what, what we used to call node hopping, right, John? Yeah. Hulking around the world. Oh, yeah. See, what's that call sign? Because you know what's even worse now with vanity calls? Huh. The, the the region numbers mean right. nothing yeah, anymore. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, a new tool call. I look at it's guy out in Salt Lake City. It's like, right, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's not fun. It's not. No. Uh, <laughs> but there's a, if you look on this nodes list that was up here, there's six calls. There's there's a couple of bridges across the country where they go from like New York and New Jersey directly over the internet to California. So it's just a quick hop across the country and things yeah. like that. Um, but uh, 
So once we're connected, so a dash four SSID is almost always going to be a BBS. So I'm going to connect to bulletin board system for those who aren't familiar. Yeah. I'm going to connect to KP3FT dash four. Right? Matt had a question to it. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. What's your question? I, I, I can wait if it's if you're busy right now. Oh, I can wait till the end. Go ahead and ask it. Okay. All, all I was going to say, Chief, was maybe I missed it in the first two minutes of your presentation. You know, I was chatting with John, so wasn't paying attention. But, you know, we use APRS a lot here in Norwich. And a lot of people understand APRS is fantastic because of its location positioning, areas and races events. You can place points on a map. And I think a lot of people I've talked to don't understand the difference between that and packet, bulletin board, file sharing. So, is the, you know, I, I, we'd appreciate it if you would share something to talk about why packet is You great. weren't here for that part. You were, you were not paying attention. Yeah. I had a whole so I wasn't paying attention. I apologize. I had a whole slide dedicated to that. But, but you yell at John. It's N2IP's fault. But you bring up a good point because I'm an APRS fan, and this packet doesn't replace APRS. APRS is you know your tactical map. You look at that display and everything like that. But APRS is not a good connected network to do error-free, uh, you know, fully acknowledged data packets. So you run these both. You, you know, your APRS, in fact, some nodes actually have links across both systems so that they can use one computer for everything. But APRS, this does not replace APRS. APRS should still be used. Um, but what this gives you is more reliable messaging, faster messaging, faxing, email, all that stuff. So right now we're connected to Jeff's bulletin board system. And I'm getting a weird message on this because I'm one of his sysops. So you'll see you know, the whole sign on message here on the screen. And then you see four message are currently on hold. Only because I'm a sysop, it's telling me, oh, we've got four messages we don't know what to do with in the bulletin board system. So I'm gonna do a review on them because I'm just right here and I'll take care of this problem. So RE is review for a sysop. And so it's telling me, so look at this, message number one that's on hold, it's a bulletin that's on hold, the size of it. It's going to weather at USA from KF5 JRV, the date is February 4th, time is 1858. And the subject line is an NWS USA forecast January 10. I'm gonna unhold that and get that to send off and get forwarded to other bulletin board systems. So these bulletin boards are all message systems that forward to each other. And it's kind of like the NTS automated, but for all kinds of messages, right? So the held number two is another weather one. I know I can unhold that one and send it on its way. So it'll now show up for people to be able to read. Number three, another one, we're gonna unhold that one. Another weather one, unhold that one and that should cover it all. Okay, when you connect to the bulletin board for the first time, it's gonna ask you a bunch of questions, your name, your zip code, your home BBS. And in this case, your home BBS, if you're gonna use Jeff, it's gonna be KP3FT. And the reason you put that in is that those uh, home BBS registries get forwarded to other ones. So when a message comes in for you, say John, then, uh, oh, it comes into my bulletin board. I've got my white page listing. Oh, you're on KP3FT. I'll just forward that message onto that BBS so that you can pick it up. So there's bulletins and there's personal messages. So you got bulletins you can read is just a general email stuff. Or you've got, you can like, I can SP or send a personal and I can send it to John at KP3FT and it'll send a personal message. It won't show up. And so I'm doing what they call a list command. So I'm going to hit L and now it's going to start sending me 40 or 24 lines at a time of bulletins that are there that are, that could be read. There's all those weather ones I just released. <laughs> So, so like there's all these, so I've got these 24 lines and let's just say, oh, look at this one, KB2 or GB2RN SK. Huh, wonder what happened there. So you see all the way over in the left column is a message number. I can just do an R command for read this number 28 or 1289 and that's gonna read that message. It's gonna put it out. And again, it's gonna pause after 24 lines and I've got it turned on so I see all the routing headers and all that stuff. 
but this came from my bulletin board through Brian, through somebody out in OK2 land. Yep. And so I hit the continue. If you set a mailbox up, yes. But if you use the local bulletin board, you don't need to set up a mail because people can just send messages to the bulletin board and then you can go how log in and pull them. But you can, you can set up an actual email. It's on the AMPR email address too. That's, on, that's not on the BBS. That's, that's on, on the, the, the mail server. Mail server. Right. Well, we've got to get to that yet. Um, so, uh, so we're done reading this and it says continue. And then it's going to go on with the rest of the listings of the bulletins. Now, what the bulletin board does is it only lists the new bulletins since the last time you logged on. But I just wanted to show you an example of reading a message, stuff like that. I think I was pretty long, pretty long winded on that one. Yeah, so sharp, you know. These are running FBB. All these nodes are running FBB. My, my, FBB. Is, yep. There's a lot of traffic on here, and I just checked this not too long ago. <coughs> Let's see. And one of the things that, could, you know, this could be a big benefit too is right now there shouldn't be a lot of censorship. On the internet, and if you want to get, you know, you know, like, who knows where that's headed right now? You know, you, you, you just honestly don't. Know I can't believe you just went down there rabbit hole. I wasn't going to talk about it. <laughs> <There's an laughs> I wasn't going to bring it up. Communicating without relying on the big partner work. But I'm just saying, like, there's. Well, it, the other thing that the other thing that it's not done either is that there's no DNS censoring. There's no any of that stuff on these networks. Yeah. So these networks are also 44 net connected. Jeff actually has an IP address. You can tell that to other IP addresses. Uh, you know, not all the nodes have that enabled yet, but uh, wow, there's a lot of traffic that came in. Can't be too much math. All right. I'm going to abort this now. Next, next pause it gives me. Hey, yeah. Uh, I got is, is that the Canadian spelling, John, or what? Echo Hotel or Alpha? Which one? Alpha. There you are. Or is that the uh, is that the O? O. The Canadian O. Okay, now I've got an opportunity to abort instead of keeping this going, and it should send me back to the BBS command prompt. Yep, all right, so now I can, I'm done on the bulletin board for today because there's other stuff I want to show you. So I'm going to quit, or most bulletin boards will also respond to buy for the B command. This one actually responds to both. Yeah, you can ask questions about this, like equipment if you want. I've seen a lot of information here. Just oh, yeah. There's cool stuff on here. I mean, so this is doing it manually. There's a program called Outpost, which is a graphical user interface that you can hook up and set up. Outpost is a great one, and you can set it to automatically check the bulletin board, say, once an hour, yeah. and you can read stuff offline and everything, too. Yeah. And you can actually set it up that, hey, I only want to look at tech bulletins. Yeah. So the, there's different message groups right now. I'm set to look at all the message groups. But if I set it to just message group tech, I would only see the tech bulletins. Yeah. And I could download those the same way. So. All right, so now we're back at Just Bulletin Board. There's chat nodes. So I talked about chat nodes. There's two ways you can do this. If you do a C and then just hit Enter and don't put anybody's call sign, it'll connect you to the local node chat. And that's just a chat system just within range. So if the network all goes down, but if you can get into the user port, everybody can be on a chat node, like NetLogger or like you would do the on Echolink, the texting and all that stuff. So we can do this. Are you in? Okay, so I'm going to connect to chat. Until I set up a channel, I'm going to talk. So 
I'm connected. It says a user. So John is logged in and it's asking me which channel I want to join. So a chat, you can have multiple channels. So let's just say we do say 30 is your standard Skyone channel. You guys want to, hey, it's always, we're always on chat channel 30 for Skyone, right? So you pop in there, it switches to channel. Now, if I, it's important to pay attention that once you're in chat, backslash for commands. So backslash Q puts you out of the node, right? So I'm on, and I think backslash C, you can switch to a different channel. So if you want to jump to another channel, because there's another conversation going on. So now I'm on channel 68. And look, John is on there and he just said hello. But the neat thing is, is that because you're in a chat environment, you're seeing who's saying what by this little bracketed call sign thing. So it's it's nice and, and it's very similar to what they do on NetLogger and things like that. Um, but this one is self-contained within the community. And uh, you know, if, if all your network connectivity is severed and you still got your local node up, it's usable. Can I just ask you what you were wearing? I'm just so used to that, it doesn't even phase me. He says that to me all the time. All right, so I'm going to quit. So I'm going to backslash Q, and it's going to quit me out of the node. Now, it may not be documented well on Jeff's node, um, but there's now what we call the converse mode. And converse is set up. There's a, a big chat node called Hub NA or Hub North America. And there's people from all over the world connected to that one. So if, if Jeff's internet is up and running and I do CONV for converse, it's going to connect me to that. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, channel. Okay. So I'm going to go channel 68. We have set up as a persistent one for the New York state channel. Um, now, the interesting thing about this Converse thing on the, the Hub NA, you can connect to it with an IRC client. You can connect to it with a web browser. So even the people that aren't on packet, they can all be on. And you can set, there's, there's a capacity of for over 38,000 channels. So you could set up a channel 146850 or 685, and you guys can all be on that. But again, that's going to be subject to network internet being severed. But for people who want to start playing and don't have packets set up yet, if you get in the habit of logging in and setting up a channel, and the nice thing is you can have it running from your cell phone. So if you're not by a radio, but you want to keep track of things and you're trying to get back to your shack, you can still stay connected with the chat stuff. Now, I don't know, let's see, who are the users? So, so if I do backslash, for who? So I, when I'm in this channel, I just did the backslash who for who's on the channel right now. And right now it's on channel 68 is me and John. If there were other people, apparently the, the, the server's closed. What's that? So uh, that's, you know, that's the chat thing. We've got worldwide chat and internet connectivity to this chat. And we've got the local stuff if the world has gone to pieces. So that's chat. And I'm going to get out of this one now because we got other things to cover. But uh, all right. So now if I, let's see, I'm, gonna, I'm back in Jeff's node now. I can do destinations again just to see what's connectable. And... I know that M1 URO, he's got SSIDs one through 11. And I'm almost positive M1 URO-11 is his DX cluster. So we're gonna try connecting to that. Connect M1 URO-11. It's not 11, it's 13. Um, and he's out in Connecticut where he's got all his stuff running. So it does jump through an internet link from my house. Oh, that's his chat node. So he's got a chat server. I got to quit out of that because I guess it's. Uh... Notice how his IP address is there because that's TCP IP enabled. Okay. 
don't think a lot of people know. I think 13 is a DX cluster. <laughs> Well, that's just a flex that node. I should have looked this up before I came over. I'm going to quit from that. I'll try one more. I think it's dash eight. <laughs> well, that's what you said about dash 11. Oh, of course. Hold on, we'll see. And we are doing good because at least it works. Well, so that's the other thing too. With Jeff having the internet, as long as there's internet, he can set you up to telnet and log in without a radio and TNC. So if you're remote somewhere else, and that's what I'm doing. That's how I get into yeah, he's, so Oh yeah, he's at my again. notes. Uh, he's he's telnetting through his, his data connection. But all right, I just I did, I don't remember the SSID. That's the one thing I don't like about FlexNet is that you don't have a node alias. So you can give it some sort of obvious name, but uh, it's, you know, it works. And, you know, this is just enough to show you that you can get a radio and TNC set up, get connected because we've got live active network. Uh, there's, there's lots of things to do. So on Jeff's node, I, I'm going to test this. I don't know if you guys set up, there's an actual mail server. So if I connect to and you don't always have to remember all the codes because or the a lot of the commands because you can hit question, question mark, mark or H depending on and it'll list and tell you what's there. I think on Jeff's node it L O to find out what services. But there's but again Jeff's note I don't know as I've edited all his files to make sure we right because uh, we only got his up and running about a month ago, running properly. Yeah, his isn't set up right. All right, we're gonna, if you're trying to make a link set up, you hit enter, it'll just quit it. So I'm going to connect to dash six for Yeah, well, now it's up. Great. I just found out. That'd be making me look bad. So N2KGC dash two is my net ROM side. I know that only because that's my node. But each of these URO nodes runs the same software package, the BBS, the mail server, all that stuff. So now if I just do mail, who's got a phone on them that's got an email address they're gonna be able to check? Uh, I have mine. I wanna do something else so they, they can be impressed. Hey, Yahoo. So now I'm in the AX mail server, right? So now I think I want to send personal, right? So I hit SP for send personal. And it'll probably say, who do you want to send to? Two. So it's KC2. I said, whoops. SFU at yahoo.com. Subject. The fact that our Aries administrator still uses Yahoo kind of scares me. Hey, I've still got an AOL account, buddy. Wow. And you're our district representative? I'm even more scared, Brian. I'll tell you how many email accounts I have and how many different servers I've got. All right. So now I put the subject line and I hit enter. Now it says enter your message test. text. So I can do that. And now when I'm done with everything in the message, I can either do a control Z or a backslash EX to tell the system that's the end of the message, write the message, right? Well, I guess I can do a period on a line by itself too. So I don't always read the directions. 
It's like reading a map. I'm not supposed to do that either. Especially your loss. You don't know where you are. Exactly. <laughs> I see. Yeah, it's still sunning. Because what it does, it, it'll write, it'll send me an acknowledgement back. There we go. Deliver? Yes, of course. That's why I typed it. Well, it does give you an opportunity to bail out of it, you know. <laughs> Request a delivery receipt. Nah, I don't need that. I'm going to hear the beep from over here. And then it'll ask me, do you want to set this as a high priority? No, oh, it's sent. It. Okay, so the message is sent. So how long it takes you to get your email now? Yes, that means anywhere from 30 seconds to four days. Yeah, because <laughs> so give it four days. Because Verizon runs it now. <laughs> so that so I'm on the mail server and I'm sending a fax is very much the same way. Uh, so I'm gonna quit out of the mail server now. And this should reconnect me back to my node. I'm sure that was good fun. Yeah. I can confirm we get it tomorrow. So and that email should come to come to you from n2kgc at n2kgc.ampr.org because it's a fully qualified IP address, uh, routable internet. Now, the one thing you can't do is large file attachments and all that stuff. Well, I mean, you can, but once it gets to this 1200 baud segment, it's going to take forever because I'm on fiber at my house. So it'll come to my house, look at a split. Although I guess it, I can forward it over the packet network too. I think it's set to do that through Rusty. Um, but I could bore you guys all night with this stuff, but I wanted to show you what you can do if you're going to make the effort to put a packet station together. Now this should drop me back to Jeff. Now I'm going to disconnect from him. And then I'll probably get it to, yeah, see now I'm disconnected. And there we go. So that's the packet demo. And there's always more to be had and more to play with. But it was just, I'm already working on an hour here, so that's plenty. But, I, uh, I finally got on an RF last night. Otherwise, I was I can be using the phone and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, I had to slap him around. I'm like, you're not doing packet, John. You're not impressed with you until you could do it at 1,200 baud. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you know, I I know that in the Shenango Club, it's always been a challenge of reestablishing packet because the APRS up at the repeater site and the shack and everything like that. There's been a lot of concern about additional RF going on up there. Well, now Shenango County's got one. Jeff's leaving it up at his house and it doesn't have to interfere with the other operations up at the repeater site. So uh, it's connected and uh, it's part of the New York network now. And, you know, we, we've got pipelines right into Albany. If there's ever an emergency, the net's down, whatever. Uh, but you can still have fun with it in the meantime. Do the BBS, like I said, the outpost program there are ways you can set up your WinLink programs to, you know, set the commands. Oh, I want to connect to KP3FT, then I want to connect to KP3FT-1, then connect to KP3 or KC3CHV- You know, you're going to have to set that script up, but then once you do it, it's automated. So your WinLink can be checked over RF, which is nice too, because then it can be done without, uh, you know, everyone's talking about, oh, go Vera now. WinLink's going Vera. Well, that's great if someone's got Vera infrastructure set up. There's no Vera around here. Vera will work on HF, and that's great. But the, the, the techs don't have HF privileges. You can still get in the same WinLink system now over our old antiquated packet system. Yeah, one thing we did notice, a lot, you know, a lot of people built, uh, when we were doing the APRS, they used like the Valfangs. One of the things that Brian found out last time he did a demonstration with this is, the Balfang's transmit receive function, their switch is too slow. So it would never hear the acknowledgement. It would never get the acknowledgement because it was still switching over. So when the, when the node sent the act back, yeah, it kept missing it. And then you would say, oh, I'll resend it again, but then it didn't hear the resend. Um, so the Chinese, the Chinese HTs have got a quasi software defined receiver front end. So it's just really uh, packet radios you want what they call a fast. Uh, switch over time between transmit and receive. And again, that's also why you can't use Vox because that transmit to receive switch over time to be able to hear the acknowledgements 
to stay connected. Because if the node doesn't get an acknowledgement back from you, it tries to retry to send it to you up to 10 times. After 10 times, it automatically discards it or disconnects you and you've lost your connection and you get to start over again. So uh, yeah, the, so the Chinese HTs assume that they won't work. Um, and even the mobiles probably gonna be the same situation because they've got those inexpensive software to find front ends that the switch over time is just too slow. It works for APRS because APRS, you're never getting an act packet back unless you're sending a message, uh, you know, a short message within APRS. Uh, so that, that's, that's, that's the main difference in APRS is a unconnected UI frames, like a UDP broadcast. We'll broadcast it out. If you get it, great. I don't have to hear from every one of you that says, yeah, I got it. Whereas a connected packet system says, no, I want every one of you that I sent something to to tell me you got that data burst. And uh, that, that's the big difference. Well, my 733A is still kicking. It's still doing the job after 25 years. Oh, the, the, the old radios were great for that. <laughs> and like I work. said, especially the ones that you've got that don't have PL, because yeah. the repeaters went PL. Yeah. Like, oh, I'll just dust that radio off now. I got to use for it. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's packet. Anybody have any questions about that? Anybody online got questions? You forgot you knew all these commands, huh, Tom? John, look at John. He's he's like, wait a minute. Can I hunt here? What about this oh, yeah. command, right? <laughs> <laughs> now I remember. I with a lot of this. Yeah. yeah. And you oh, may yeah. even have an old TNC sitting around somewhere, got right? Yeah. Oh, I do. I got my 1270C still. You know. Yeah. And, and my 733A. Right. Well, I've got a couple of PK232s kicking around. Yeah. Tom, Tom used to do his bulletin board forwarding through Stanford and Smyrna at night. He used that user port. Yeah, but I mean, is there, I guess. You can connect. Not just Stanford, but, but uh, so are there efforts underway to expand outward? We're putting more nodes up and backbone linking them, yes. So, so. No, actually, I, if I can get up there and with the snow right now, if we got one bad serial port, so we got to swap a card. But uh, I want to try to link the RF to Putnam County on the 220 band. We've got a 220 radio up there, ready to go. And we may pick up uh, one of the stations in Northern Connecticut on the same frequency. Um, I'm probably going to put a six meter radio up at Cherry Valley because the stuff that's up in Oswego that's dis that's only connected through Rochester right now, I want to see if we can get a six meter link between Oswego County to Otsego County to have an RF link across the network and bring those two islands. If I do that and then get the 220 from Stanford link to Putnam County, that'll get us almost all the way down to New York City. And we've got the equipment, the antennas and stuff around the tower in Bristol to put a node with three links or a user port and two links. So then we can push towards Cattaraugus County and Buffalo. Uh, there, there's a lot of stuff in the works right now that uh, that I uh, we're trying to get to. Winter months aren't, aren't always the best. The guys up in Roger, or up in uh, Wayne County, there is a big node that there's some of their stuff has just gone down, so we got to go up and kick it or swap on a TNC, and uh, then I'll bring their links back up. Uh, so yes, there's active expansion going on all over the place. Stanford, I all, I would like to get Camelback Mountain on because we can link Camelback into New Jersey. The problem was getting linked to downstate is the Catskill Mountains. And there's no direct path up and down the Hudson. We used to have a path, but it was in Greene County that there was a, a node, they lost that node and we can't get it back. So we've lost our RF path. So we're trying to find other paths around. And that may be through New Jersey into Pennsylvania and up into New York. And that's how it used to be back in the Nita days. If anybody's interested, I've got the old maps of where we used to have stuff. Cortland used to be a big hub site, Norwich linked to Cortland and then back to Oneana. So Norwich was a big, a big uh, hub site. What, what about down the Elmira? And there used to be one, I, I don't know of anything down there. You know, Binghamton yeah, and the Southern cool. Tier was always anti-packet. They were a strange bunch. So we used to go right over top of them past them. Well, I lived in Bessel, I could always hook up with Elmira yep. and go from there. Yes, there was a node in Elmira, I remember that now. I can't, and, remember, the, I can't remember the call sign, but yeah, if you um, if you search uh, Nita and uh, 
Tad Torborg, K E two D W. He's got an archive of all the old NETA okay. documents, stuff like that. Right. So you can look at all the old packet maps okay. and everything. Yeah. So look up Tad and then NETA, you'll find his website. Okay. All right. And all the FlexNet commands and everything like that, he's got the manual up there. So okay. you can, uh, but yeah, the heyday of uh, the NETA network that yeah. went from Maine to Ohio. That sounds for me. Yeah, we just talked that. So Charles uh, Hargrove, N2NOV, uh, NOV, is the 44 net IP administrator for New York uh -huh. State. He, uh, he and I are pretty good friends, and he runs a JNOS system, and he's who forwards bulletins to me and, uh, and Jeff and all that. But we just got a hold of a group down in North and South Carolina that's got not as good a network, yeah. but they've got an IP link. So we're, we're going to bridge the, the New York to down to the Carolina stuff. So oh, yeah. that's one of those islands that will be bridged by the Internet. But, again, because it's going to be done over 44 net, yeah. if there's ever any censoring or filtering done based on DNS requests, yeah. We're, we're, we go right around that. Okay. So the 44 net stuff gets around that stuff. Yeah. 44 net is a peer to peer network. There's master servers that distribute what they call the IP NCAP file. Yeah. And all that is is like, oh, so you want to connect to this one. So here's the lookup. You're going to connect to their public IP address this way and that way. Because we use 44 net for DMR repeaters, for echo link stuff. There's an Arden, uh, you know, gateways and things like that. It's not just packet. So the 44 net. Uh, but Jeff's node is enabled for it. My node's enabled for it. So you can pop in there and issue the telnet command to another, uh, actually you can even do a regular internet. You can ping and stuff like that. Uh, so that's kind of neat. And uh, there's a lot of flexibility. It's, it's really a transport network. If you really want to just do WinLink, you use the packet system as the transport network. If you're really just into DX cluster and don't want to be connected to the internet, well, you use this as the transport network. Um, and because we're getting more and more of the stuff IP enabled, you know, just keeping in mind that you got this speed limitation, so you can't do video teleconferencing over 1200 block network, no. but you can still send email and the chat, you know. Have you ever actually tried it? Yes. <laughs> John made the mistake of, or I made the mistake of trying to send John's ampr.org email a big file, and it finally timed out after about three days because it just couldn't push it. It was a huge file that I included them on. I'm like, oh, just, I shouldn't have done that because that's going to go over 1,200 bar like. But uh, yeah, so I mean, if you guys get into it and you play with it, uh, by all means, ping me. I'm good for assistance and, and ideas. And you know, uh, some of the software you may try to use, I can offer some suggestions, but I'm not going to be an expert on it. Oh, but it's did fine. you get it? Did you get your email? Bunch you got all this. Yeah, it's just a cold work. Thanks, Brian, very much. What's this? What's this? The call sign for Stanford? N2PKB. And that one starts at zero. And, and you know, from a club perspective, I think WinLink, we're talking about that obviously. I think the only one that has had a long term setup in the club has been 82TM Tom. I don't know if you still do, Tom, but for the longest time, you're the only one at your house with this set up. And that's a good skill for people to learn because like, look at Puerto Rico. When the league wanted to send people down to help out, they were specifically looking for people with wind league skills to go down and help deal with communications between fire departments, per emergency personnel and stuff like that. 